Hi guys, uh, happy Wednesday. So we are moving on now to lesson two of unit six, which is a continuation of the Renaissance. And I'm wearing my Renaissance Masters Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle shirt uh, in honor of, of today's lesson. And so the Renaissance, yes, we typically talk, you know, you, you think of when you, when you hear the term, you know, Renaissance and you think of that era, you're, you're thinking of art and sculpture and, and those types of things. But there's actually so much more to it. Um, it was literally this cultural shift uh, that, that is going to make huge impacts, uh, you know, just in, in how everything intellectually operates uh, for, for centuries to come. And so today we're kind of, I'm giving you a little bit more than just, hey, here are the high Renaissance masters and this is their famous stuff. Um, we are going to, to look at very famous paintings and sculptures and such tomorrow um, because, you know, obviously it's definitely worth seeing but, uh, you know, today is kind of more informational and less visual. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, all right. So secularism is basically non-religious, you know, separating this, you know, the state and religion that that's being secular. And you start to see during the Renaissance, um, this movement not away from faith and, and not away from religion, but kind of looking at things not always through the lens of the church, you know, kind of being able to finally say like, well, I'm going to kind of look at, you know, maybe some other types of, of knowledge and, and cultures without constantly comparing it back to Christianity and to what my priest says and that kind of thing. And um, this intellectual movement becomes known as humanism. And the man that kind of is the father of that and kind of kickstarts it, so to speak, is named Francesco Petrarch. And um, he, he's essentially arguing, number one, like use your brain for more than just like uh-huh, yes, sir, and whatever the whatever your priest is telling you, but you know, get get some knowledge base on a lot of things. Like know know a little bit about a lot instead of knowing a whole lot about a little bit. Um and, and so he, he starts to say, you know, to stu study Study grammar, rhetoric, poetry, philosophy, history, science. Study all of it. Try to get, try to get the basics of as much stuff as you can to create a more like well-rounded person instead of just this like almost religious robot created by the Catholic Church at the time. Um, and so, if you if you if you look at Petrarch, that shift in, in how you look at culture and how you look at things is really the precursor to people, of course, then individually breaking down the Bible and saying, I don't necessarily think that what the Bible is telling us here is what my priest in my church has been telling me. And of course, you know, that's essentially the Protestant Reformation, which is the second half of this unit. So um, it also a huge thing that, that you can see in the modern era uh, right now in your life that stems from Petrarch and humanism is, is how education works. You know, in education, we don't teach you a whole lot about a little bit. We teach you a little bit about a whole lot of different things so that when you are ready to graduate, you've been exposed to many, many different things and you've been given the basic information of many different things. So you can say, hey, I really like this or I'm really good at this. So I'm going to go out in my life and I'm going to pursue this particular field, you know, instead of trying to figure that out later. Um, and so even education really and the way that it operates stems from the Renaissance and the creation of, of humanism through Petrarch. And, you know, people having this individualized viewpoint of 
the Bible and and becoming more literate and and having a higher understanding of things comes from, of course, things being printed and and created by authors that are written in vernacular language. Um, this was actually a part of your Unit Five test and Unit Five information. You know, and vernacular is your everyday speech. You know, prior to vernacular literature being printed in mass, everything was written in Latin. Um, and so, you know, people, the only people that could read that were really wealthy people that had been educated via private tutors and things like that. Well, once things again, like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Dante's Inferno, um, you know, and then of course, just honestly, like your everyday little pamphlets and advertisements and things. And, you know, your very first like newspapers start coming out. Um, all of this really shifts the overall literacy rate of Europe. Now, again, I don't want you to think this happens like in a split second. This takes centuries to happen. But regardless, again, the creation of the printing press by the German Johann Gutenberg and then the authors printing their works out in vernacular language really changes things. Um, and so I have a cool story, a personal story about uh, a printing press. So my husband and I, for our 10 year wedding anniversary, went to Boston and we went to see the Old North Church, of course, because it's very famous in American revolutionary history. That's where they, you know, hang the lantern, one if by land, two if by sea. And um, all around the Old North Church, you have original buildings that were built, you know, mid uh, or early to mid uh, 18th century. And the, some of them are still operating as obviously tourist destinations, but as the little shops that they originally were. And one of them is a print shop. Um, and half of it is like a chocolate shop where they actually like will even make truffles and stuff in front of you. And then the other half is a print shop. So uh, when I went in there, of course, I was way more interested in the print shop side. I'm not a chocolate person, but um it, it's, it was a, it was a true like old, big wooden, just like in the picture, like printing press. And so the guy gives his spiel on it. And of course I'm fascinated because I actually, of course, teach all about the printing press and he lets me come around the railing and actually like use it. And, and so I'm like a kid and I'm literally a kid in a candy shop, but on the printing press side, haha. <laughs> and uh, so I get to press it and if you, if you know anything about printing presses and watch a video uh, after this slide, they're little metal pieces that have, you know, the letters carved in the top of them. And so the printer, of course, would print however many pages of that particular page, but then he had to take all of the little metal letters out and then put in the new page. And I remember I was sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, like, that is very tedious. And the, the guy that ran the shop was like, well, actually they could do it quicker than you think. Like they, the pr good printers could easily reach back um, behind them where the cases of letters were. And they didn't even have to look, they could just like grab what they needed and, and, and switch them out pretty quickly. Uh, much like us, you know, typing on a keyboard without having to look. Um, and so I look at the case where all the metal letters are and he tells me, he says, yeah, he said, you know, the capitalized letters were in the top of the case because you don't use capitalized letters as often. He said in the, the non-capitalized letters were in the bottom of the case so that they could get to them easier and quicker. And that's why we call them upper and lower case letters. My mind was like blown in that moment. It was, it was, it, it was one of those like really like whoa moments. I mean, I'd, I'd never thought about why do we say uppercase and lowercase? If you think about it, if, it doesn't make any sense until you understand the history behind why we say it. And so that was one of those kind of like really neat moments where I was like, oh my God. Um, so, uh, little fun history fact there uh, in the video, which this is actually the first year I've shown this video. And the guy does talk about like upper and lower case, but obviously I had already found that out thanks to my printing press guy in Boston. Um, but 
the guy in the vi in this video actually gives you another little history uh, lesson about a phrase that we use that's based on printing press history. So kind of fun stuff. So I, I encourage you. It's a little dated of a video, but it's still pretty good. And it, and it has a it shows you a printing press in action. Um, all right. So moving on to art. All right. What makes art so special in the Renaissance versus the other years, you know, prior to the Renaissance? Well, I kind of my head's a little bit in the way, but um, if you look at the top picture on this slide, you can see that it's pretty flat. There's really not a background. I mean, the background just looks like a like a yellow wall for the most part. But if you look at the picture below it, all of a sudden, when you look in the background, you see mountains, trees, a road winding. Um, my head is blocking it, but you can see the archway of a door uh, in a building and the building has depth and perspective to it. And that's really what was a huge shift um, it is being able to master, as it says, the, the laws of perspective or the technique to give three dimensional depth to a two dimensional surface like a canvas. You and I take that for granted all of the time. I mean, heck, right now, if you're watching this video, you can see me and I'm three dimensional on a flat surface. Uh, so, so again, our TV screens, our computer screens, our, our telephones, we are very like inundated with that. But think, put yourself in the shoes of a 15th century human being that has never seen anything like that. And they walk by a canvas in their market square of an artist showcasing this and they're going to be like, oh, my God, I can reach through it. Um, you know, it's going to it's going to be the equivalent of us like seeing a hologram in person for the first time. You know, uh, it, it's going to blow their mind. And and this truly just changes art forever. Right. I mean, now you can't you know, you don't look at a painting or look at or, or much without seeing, you know, d perspective and dimension within it. And so, you know, what makes that that's really kind of what makes the Renaissance art so different. Um, sculpture and architecture is also, you know, hugely innovative during this time frame. Um, the most famous scu sculptor really out of the, or I wouldn't say, I don't know, Michelangelo is pretty famous for his David, but Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci were really both renaissance men um you know i'm not like a huge like art history person but i can tell you like you know clearly leonardo da vinci like wins the award for most famous renaissance artist and and he could do it all right like he could paint he could sculpt he could he was an engineer he was an inventor i mean he was all the things but honestly so was michelangelo um michelangelo was equally impressive uh in his skill set Donatello, what's interesting about him is he was predominantly a sculptor, but he lived prior to Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo in the earlier Renaissance and was actually an inspiration for both those men. Um, and, and he brought back and kind of perfected, you know, Roman and Greek sculpt sculpting that hadn't been seen in almost a thousand years. And, and so, you know, he is highly influential uh, as well, but he predominantly did sculpting, which is why he's not quite as famous because he didn't do like as much of a variety of stuff. Um, out of your, I'm a shirt and this thing, um, out of the four Renaissance masters, Raphael is probably your least famous. Um, and it's because honestly, he died really young. Like the and and well, I say really young. He actually probably died about at an average age for that time frame. But the other three lived either into like their sixties, even up into their eighties. Whereas Raphael died at like thirty-seven, um, and he was predominantly a painter. And he has two famous works of art. One is I can't remember something about Athens. It's like the School of Athens or something, and it's it's a recreation of a very like obviously Athenian Greek um, depiction. And then the other famous one is actually very famous for just the bottom. 
So he, everybody painted the Madonna and child, which is of course the Virgin Mary and, and the child Jesus Christ. Everybody painted it. There's like, I don't even know how many versions of the Madonna uh, that came out of the Renaissance. There's a ton. And, um, and Raphael painted his version and it's very famous, but the most famous part of it is the little, is the little angel babies at the bottom. Um, you see those, re you see those everywhere, you know, they've got their little, their little faces and their little angels, the little wings. Um, that, the, and that's actually the bottom of his painting. Uh, so anyways, that, that's kind of the main thing he's, he's famous for. So you can't talk about the Renaissance in art without talking about the Mona Lisa FYI, she really wasn't famous until 1911, and it's because she was stolen. So, yes, she was famous amongst the art world. Okay, but again, as I told you on Monday, that's a pretty elitist group of people. You know, only really wealthy people are, are people that have said, I'm going to make art my life and my profession know about a lot of this stuff. So, um, the Mona Lisa in 1911 is stolen by uh, one of the construction workers that was doing some renovating and things like that at the Louvre, which of course is the museum where she is. And they stole her not really understanding or thinking that this was going to become obviously a worldwide scandal. This is huge. This is, you know, this is a Da Vinci. This is an original Da Vinci. He didn't do many portraits, so it makes her extra special. Um, you know, and so the, they kind of, honestly, the, the men that ended up kind of masterminding her theft freaked out a little bit and were like, and they just put her in their basement for, for a very long time until they finally were like, okay, I guess we need to, maybe try to sell her, get rid of her. Uh, but the guy that was the mastermind, he only served like eight months in prison. But um, anyways, she, you know, this huge worldwide manhunt goes, you know, to try to find her. So, so her face is on the cover of like every single newspaper uh, in the world. And so your average person who knows not, you know, who, who really would never get to get a chance to see one of Da Vinci's paintings all of a sudden is looking at the Mona Lisa on the front page of the news. And so they get to look at her and, and study her and, and be intrigued by her because she is intriguing. Um, number one, we don't know who she is. Was she a merchant's wife? Was she Da Vinci's lover? Like who knows? And then of course we don't really understand what her face is saying. Like, is she smirking? Is she annoyed? Is she, is she lovingly looking at somebody? You don't know what her face says. And a lot of the reason why you can't quite tell what she's thinking or what her emotion is, because she doesn't have any eyebrows. Um, you know, your eyebrows very much like frame your face and frame your emotions. And, you know, for whatever reason, she really doesn't seem to have them. And that I think that's a part of why we can't quite tell what she's thinking. Um, but that's, that's honestly, she was not truly famous or iconic until she was stolen in 1911. So a little history behind Mona Lisa. Finally, uh, for this lesson, there were uh, plenty of things coming out of Northern Europe during the Renaissance. Uh, not nearly as m much stuff as Italy, clearly, but um, probably the most famous Northern piece of art was the Ghent altarpiece. And it is not now. Okay. Another thing I meant to tell you that I forgot to tell you about the Mona Lisa. I've actually been to the Louvre in Paris and, and looked at the Mona Lisa and she's actually very small. She's only about like, she's about that big. Maybe she's not very, she's not very big at all. Um, but the again, altarpiece on the other hand is of course an altarpiece. So it's 11 feet by 15 feet. And, um, it is the kind of central piece of a movie called The Monuments Men. And it is a true story about a special unit that gets put together during World War II of art history professors, uh, art, art, just, you know, curators, um, art restoration professionals. And they create this unit of men. And this, again, this is a true story to go behind enemy lines sometimes and go try to get this Renaissance and very famous art before the Nazis can get their hands on it or before they can steal it. 
And um, again, the, kind of one of the central pieces of the movie that these monuments men are trying to get to is the Ghent altarpiece in Belgium. Um, so, uh, like I said, true story and, and an interesting movie. It's got Matt Damon and George Clooney. So it's, it's not like it's an old movie if you're kind of like, oh, whatever. Um, it's, it's pretty good. So that is it um, for today. This is the Crash Course Renaissance video again in class tomorrow. We're going to be kind of just looking at some pictures of, of some of the more famous pieces of Renaissance art. I will post a, a video that showcases those for you guys online. It would behoove you to watch the crash course before you take your formative tomorrow. And um, that's what we're doing tomorrow. So don't expect a video from me because uh, that's, that's what I want you doing. So anyways, uh, y'all have a good one and I'll see you Friday. Bye. And oh, Banks says bye. <laughs>